Uh, so, good morning. My name is Elizabeth. Um, I'm the chair of political science at Cal Poly. I've been at Cal Poly, the real Cal Poly, for, um, yeah. Oh, good. Some of, some of you laugh, so some of you realize there's a rivalry between which Cal Poly is the real Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo or Pomona. It's San Luis Obispo. Um, I'm the chair of political science. I've been at Cal Poly for, this is my 11th year, a long time. Um, so, I get to talk with you today about your teaching demos. Um, I'm curious, how many of you have done a teaching demo on a job talk before? Excellent, excellent. Um, how did it go? I got the job. Congratulations, that's great. <laughs> okay, great. And how did yours go? Uh, good, very well. Good. Well, congratulations on um, a successful teaching demo. How many of you are frightened of your teaching demo? A few? Yeah, starting to be? Yeah, yeah, it's a little bit scary, right? It's like the most artificial environment you could ever find yourself. Because you're coming into a classroom which may or may not have students in it, right? Um, which you have, there's no sort of past for you. You don't know anything about the dynamics of the classroom the dynamics of the people in it. Um, you don't know what, they, what their background knowledge is. Um, you don't have a future with them, potentially, right? I mean, hopefully you do, <laughs> right? But like, as of that day, you don't have a, a set future, so you can't be like, this is how this fits in, and remember where we were at. Like it's like a first date that has a lot hanging on it, like more so than your average first date, right? Um, so, um, or it feels like there is, and there is, right? In a recent survey of um, faculty and biology departments that require both a teaching presentation and a research presentation, 47% of respondents said that they weigh the teaching demonstration and research demonstration equally, which is scary enough. You want to know the scarier part? 28% said the teaching demonstration is more important to them, right? So there's a lot weighing on this, and it's extra artificial because they can take so many forms, right? So, you can or cannot use this worksheet, but just to sort of keep us on track, we're gonna do a little bit of reflection and thinking, and then brainstorming out. So the first thing I want you to reflect on is thinking about your most impactful learning experience, right? What made it an important learning experience? Think in terms of context, in terms of action, and in terms of outcomes. And when you're done with that one, reflecting on your teaching style in the classroom, what types of educational experiences and context best suit how you're comfortable in the classroom, and then your best advice. I will let it be either. But it's when you learn the most. Anything, you bet.
And take maybe 30 more seconds, even if you're not going to be quite done yet, because then we're going to pair and share. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just the top three. Oh, top, top three, Before, above the line. So our next step, I want you to pair up and share your responses. Now, you don't have to share. If your learning experience and teaching experience are sort of deeply personal, you don't have to share them. But I want you in particular to think about the best advice you've received and sort of pairing and sharing and talking about that best advice that you've received. And you can pair and share in two, groups of two or groups of three or four, however you're comfortable. Okay, so let's take another 30 seconds or so and then we'll get ready and report out. Are y'all ready? So you want to hear the thing I heard most often? How many of you have received no to very little advice about your teaching demo? Yeah, that was the primary thing that I heard listening to you. And I, believe it or not, I can hear almost all of the groups <laughs> from where I'm sitting. Um, which is interesting, right? Considering that, I mean, 30% of the people you're going to be seeing value teaching more than you re your te teaching presentation more than your research presentation and about 50% of them value them equally, it's kind of odd, which is why, I mean, I didn't get much advice about my teaching demo before I did it either. So um, it's great that you're all here. So what advice do, did you, have you gotten? Yeah. Well, so I, I um, teach for like a tutoring company, mm -hmm. so this is not university teaching advice, but I was told to connect with your audience. Yeah. Um, so like to ask 
ask somebody a question and you get the ball rolling kind of thing. Yeah. So on the back side, I've sort of um, tried to outline a little bit of how I've organized the advice into the eight million pieces of advice that I'm going to try and give you or we're going to talk about today. Mm -hmm. So the, one of the first ones is, so there's sort of the before you go column, which is on the far left. There's the middle one, which is while you're there. And then there's the other one, the triangle, which is sort of the overall. But the interact is a big piece, right? Um, have, any, have you all heard the phrase about voting in Chicago, do it early and often? It's a political science joke. Oh, <laughs> so um, before sort of the modern era of voting, there was um, believed to be a lot of corruption in voting in Chicago, and people would vote early and vote often. Um, and, and you want to think about interacting and connecting with your audience early. Even if your best style of teaching, the way you show best, is with slides and a presentation, Make sure that you explicitly build in opportunities to connect with your audience, right? Ask them questions, get them engaged. You're trying to demonstrate how you work with novices or how you work with people who don't know as much as you do, even if they don't. So that's a great piece of advice. So are they going to play novice? Oh, like such a good question. <laughs> I don't know. Like novice. I don't know. Right? I think so in, in in my department and in the interdisciplinary searches that I've sat on, I've probably sat on 25 or 30 searches in the time that I've been there. Um, no one has ever explicitly tried to blow people out of the water. Right? But I can't guarantee you that's not going to happen. Right? All departments are different. All institutions have a different organizational culture. Right? You may get into a situation where someone does try to do that. What, but do you think, so the real question I think you want to ask yourself, are they really trying to blow you out of the water? Or are they trying to, what was your piece of I advice? This is a signal. This is something yes. we talked about was don't be afraid of like something goes wrong. Yes. Because then that shows them how you react to, or you're able to improvise, react to unforeseen circumstances. Exactly. Anticipate that something's going to go wrong. Right? Don't, don't. Don't believe that's not going to happen. Anticipate it. Think about the things that could possibly go wrong before you start. Right? So think about what happens if the technology doesn't work. Right? So in one of mine, um, I had a PowerPoint. And um, I, had, I had a great talk to go with it. It was great. The PowerPoint didn't work. I had to give the entire thing extemporaneously without my slides. I had to figure out ways to make visuals and engage audiences. And it turned out to be one of the best talks I've ever give, given but because I had anticipated what happens if the technology goes wrong. Or if you teach in a more interactive learning style, what happens if people don't engage? Right? What will you do? What tricks do you use to get people to engage? So think about when you're in the classroom, right? what happens when your students aren't engaging? It's a Friday morning at 8 AM, and no one. right? I don't, so Thursday night um, in San Luis Obispo is farmer's market, so Friday morning classes are a dead zone. Right. Um, so what, how do you get those students to engage? Right? What do you do? Right? And so think about pairing and sharing, right? trying to lower the stakes for them to start getting involved. Engage one-on-one. -on -one, right? But think about what are those things that are going to happen or could happen. And anticipate, prepare for them. Because you'll never know. Right? You could be, so today, I wasn't sure if I was going to walk into a room with a, a group of five people or a group of 60 people. And I was sort of, sort of told to prepare for that range, right? <laughs> when I came in this morning, I did not anticipate us all circling up, right? I did, so you prepare and you be ready to go on the fly. But you have to be comfortable doing that, right? So don't, it's not an exercise in pushing you outside of where you're comfortable, but it is an exercise in being able to adapt. So my guess is, I do think there are some places where people might actually try to shoot you down for lots of reasons. You might not be their preferred candidate. It's just the culture. I don't know. They're mean people. Right? Um, but I think lots of times, people are trying to figure out how you're going to react and how you'll respond. Um, and so figure that out. But yeah, I think, I think you could be right. There could be places when they do do that. And then it's sort of an exercise in how do I respond. OK. Other pieces of advice? Yes. If I brought you here, I want you to succeed. <laughs> and so that made me feel better. Yep. If I didn't like you, I wouldn't have offered you to come on and do it in the demo. So we're not like, and so it, 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 I think I 
hope it helped just relieve a little bit of the stress. Like they wouldn't have flown me out, brought me in, invited me in unless they expected me to be able to do my best work. That's right. And so the expectation isn't for me to fail. The expectation is for me to like make it harder for them to make a choice. That's exactly right. Um, and so just that breeze, I was like, okay, like I got I got this far because of who I am. So yep. That expectation is for me to just be myself so breathe let that happen. That's exactly right. So I think there's actually two great pieces of advice in there. And they're actually one of the ones that I have under my green triangle, which are the first one is actually breathe. Right? Inhale in through the nose for a count of four. Exhale out through the mouth for a count of four. Try it. Inhale in. Exhale out. Calm your nervous system down, right? Interviews are already high stakes enough. They brought you out for a reason. The academic job market, tough, right? We're getting, um, for a weird unicorn position that shouldn't <laughs> exist anywhere in the world that we wrote because it sort of exactly suited exactly what we needed, we had 75 applicants this year. And there should not be 75 people who have that set of specialties in the world, right? I mean, there should be, but there aren't because of the way political science is set up. But for most job applications, or most job postings, you're in a field of 150 or 200. If you're one of the people brought to campus, they brought you for a reason. They're hoping that you succeed. They want you to be a colleague. Again, not always, <laughs> but most of the time. Most of the people there will want you to exceed, th succeed. They want you to be a member of their department. right? Um, and they will do what they can to help you, and they are there to support you. OK, great. Other pieces of advice? Yeah. 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 So um, the first box, get as much information as you can. Let's list the things of information that we might want to get. So I think one of the first things to figure out is who is your audience? Are there, are there going to be students in the audience or is it just going to be faculty and administrators? Are the students there in a, so sometimes we've brought people in and had them teach in an actual existing classroom. And sometimes it's been um, sort of during our open hour and it's, we invite all students and it's whoever shows up. Right? At my teaching demonstration at Cal Poly, there were no students in the audience. It was all faculty. Right? And it's the first thing in the morning. You don't know any of these people. Right? You haven't even really been introduced to them. Right? But figuring out who your audience is. Are they GE students? Right? General education students? Are they majors? Right? Trying to match your audience before you go. Do you have another? Well, I was going to ask. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, could Zoomer be a good, like, just like asking them, like, oh, hey, introduce yourself. Mm -hmm. Number one, what's your major? You mm -hmm. know, I feel like that would maybe get a laugh. Yep. Um, so, but I feel like maybe some people might be offended by that. Yeah, so I think there's, um, humor has to be used well, right? And so it's, again, it's not about, um, pushing you out of your comfort zone. It's about if you have humor as part of your teaching skill set, use it. If you're comfortable um, with that idea of being in that potentially awkward situation and diffusing the, the humor that way, yeah. Um, I think that's a, that can be a good way to go. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more later about like that idea of committing um, to who's in the room. But yeah, figuring out who's there, using humor. What other things might we want to know? About a teaching. Uh huh. Well, so I have a, actually have a yeah. question, which is if it is just faculty, yeah. and you know that it's going to be faculty, yeah. do you prepare to teach to them as if they were undergrads? Yeah. Like, yes. <laughs> yeah. So that, so my, in my experience, yes. So, and this is one of the places where I see people get tripped up the most often because it's awkward. Right, when you're a graduate student, um, maybe you haven't, I hadn't defended yet, right? I hadn't even, I had two empirical chapters. This is all dirty, dirty laundry. Um, right, and you're coming in and, and these are people who are full and tenured faculty who are going to be supervising you and, and mentoring you. It's awkward. So what I do and what I tell people to do, and no one, not very often do they actually take me up on this, but this is my advice. Ask them at the beginning, is it okay if I treat you like I would treat my students? Most of the time they will say yes. And if they say yes, 
commit to that idea. Don't hear them say yes and then back away from that idea, right? If they've told you it's okay for you to treat them like students, they're giving you their permission and you should treat them like students. So in my teaching demonstration at Cal Poly, I picked uh, five faculty members. I made them sit back to back in chairs and I made them build widgets for 30 minutes, right? I committed to the idea that they were students and that they were gonna go through this exercise as if they were students. <coughs> it's scary to do that, but it, it works. It's, I think it's far more damaging to ask them if you can do that and then back away from that idea because then you're always caught in this, can I really like force you, yeah, and can I force you to answer this question or, or right, how do I get you to answer this question? And I, you have to do it respectfully, but you all treat your students respectfully and as if they were autonomous adults, faculty will respect that too, right? So I say yes, if they tell you that that's okay, commit to that idea. Other pieces of advice? Yeah? Yeah, um, so that's a great question. Um, giving a job talk or a teaching talk? Like a teaching talk is definitely a little bit more informal where you're actually just like talking to graduate students about aspects of your research. So then I think it's a question about what the purpose of that time frame is, right? If the purpose is to give them a sense of what you're going to be like as a graduate instructor, yeah. set it up that way. If it's to give them a sense of what your research is and how you might think about bringing them on as research partners, then frame it that way. So I think that's one of the other parts of this is getting really clear about what the goals of that session are. Whatever your session is that they give you for your teaching demo, right? Figure out what the goals are. Other things that you might want to know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What topic do they want? Yep. Yeah. So um, there's a whole section on topics um, and whether or not you have the freedom to choose. Sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. Sometimes departments will pick. This is the topic you're going to present on. And other times for us it's pick whatever you want to teach on. Right? Um, if, if you have freedom to choose, should you do a little snooping and try to find something that's complementary or do, does that really matter? Um, so what I would do is go back to the job ad. I go back to the job ad and go back to your, either your letter of interest or your statement of teaching, right, if you had to submit one. Uh, because the job ad will give you a sense of what they're looking for content-wise. And then your teaching, either your teaching statement or your cover letter should give them a sense of how you are or what you think you are in the classroom. So if you say, um, I'm an active, I, I try to actively engage in my students and try to, um, build learning experiences where students are actively shaping what they're doing, you probably don't want to come in and lecture, right? You want to find the overlap between what they're looking for substantively and what your areas of knowledge and expertise are, right? So you have, you applied for this job, they selected you to come out for an interview, they see an overlap. But I think if you have the freedom to choose, look for that overlap. We've had people who have not done that, right, who did not, teach something inside the parameters of the job ad, and it doesn't go well, right? Because your faculty are left wondering how you fit the actual job ad that was written. I think you want to, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was just yeah. Advice. yeah, yeah, yeah. In a situation where they give you the topic, mm -hmm. um, my advice was uh, don't presume to know the way they want you to So, um, yes, ultimately, a teaching demonstration is about your engagement, right? Don't try to anticipate too much what they're looking for, because you will almost always be wrong. It won't matter which way you go, 50% of the time you will be wrong. 
with 50% of the faculties, as an example. Um, on another job search I was sitting on, someone came in and did an active learning exercise and they started with a parent chair, kind of like we did. One faculty, these are in the same department, one faculty member when they were reviewing the teaching presentation said something along the lines of, um, I didn't appreciate that that candidate did this sort of emotionally, emotional gobbledygook at the beginning that had no purpose, right? Same department, another faculty member said, but that was the best part of the teaching presentation. That was where students most engaged. So s faculty are looking for different things. So the idea is be true to yourself, right? If you, um, you are trying to give the best image and the most authentic image of you as an educator, asterisk, as you are right now, right? And so don't think about what topics, think about who's in the department, but don't, don't try and anticipate. Um, don't try and foreguess how people are gonna react, right? All that's gonna do is get up in your mind and it's gonna s inhibit your ability to actually present the most authentic and best version of yourself as an educator. Other things good to know, how long do you have, right? Um, is there technology available? Right? What's the room set up? Do they want you to talk about or review your teaching pedagogy or philosophy? Sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. Right? But think about how you build that in. Do you demonstrate that and talk about it or do you just talk about it? Yep. Is there going to be wireless internet available if you need it? Right. Again, anticipating those things you think you might want or need and trying to get as much information as you can. Other things that you might want information about? So in terms of your topic, sometimes you'll be able to pick, sometimes you won't, right? Um, I think one of the biggest pieces of advice is to keep it simple. Right? Less is more often frequently more in a teaching demo. I've seen people get tied up with time. Right? In any learning experience and in any teaching experience, you will never get across everything you want to get across in the way you want it to get, come across, right? You just won't, right? Which is why classes aren't one session. Classes are a, a semester or a quarter. And even then, right, you might not get there. It's okay. Uh, to not get all the way through your presentation. It's okay to um, build in, or actually what you should do is anticipate and build in breakpoints, right, where you can stop if you need to. So that if you know you have 50 minutes for a teaching demonstration and you want to leave 10 minutes or five minutes for questions, right, anticipate what happens if I start 10 minutes late. What happens if part of my exercise runs long? What happens if part of my exercise runs short? Build in some of that flexibility so that you can um, adapt on the fly, right? Just like you would in a classroom. And then if it gets to the end of your time and, you're, and you realize you have 40 more slides left, breathe in through the nose, out through the mouth, and figure out how you're going to adapt. Anticipate that, right? So what happens if I end on slide 39 of 70? We didn't get through all the material today, but let me foreshadow what's coming, right? Let's talk about where we're headed next. Let me ground some of the questions that you're going to face as you do the next reading, right? Or these are the things you should, have thought, you should think about as you go into the next class, right? Anticipate some of those things happening. Right? So that if it does, you have a way of exiting gracefully. Right? The, one of the worst things you can probably do is feel like you have to rush through the rest of the 41 slides. Right? And, and sort of, I didn't have time to get to this, I didn't have time to get to this, I didn't have time to get to this, but it's really, really important. Right? But you get nervous, you feel like you're on display, and it happens sometimes. I've seen it happen. Mm -hmm. Sort of envisioning it as something up in the line, and so like do that regardless of if you plan to 
Yeah. I think you can, I think you can, right? Remember, you're entering a classroom where you don't have any experience with what students know or where they're in, so it's really tempting to do sort of a first day top of, top of. And you can. I did that and it was fine. Um, but I think if you don't and you want to do something that's sort of in the, where you might envision something in the middle of the quarter, it's okay to do that too. Preface it. So remember in our last class, we talked about um, the, the freedoms guaranteed by the First Amendment. And we started to place those at, um, in a higher institution of higher education as they apply to free speech on college campuses, right? Now we're going to build out of that, right? So you've provided them the context, you've given them the background, and you can move into, here's the material for today. And then as you leave, you can talk about, so let's compare campus reactions to conservative right-wing speakers when they come to campus, right? How should they respond? How do they respond? And you can do that. And then if you have time and you have that material prepped, if you need filler, you can build in some of that material too. But yeah, I think that's a good idea, providing that context in and out, right? I think thinking about teaching demos as learning demos, not teaching demos, is a pretty powerful switch and frame, right? Your research talk is all about you. Right? It's all about what you've done, what you know, what your contributions are. It's tempting, um, and I've seen people do it, teach a teaching demonstration the same way. Let me amaze you with how smart I am, with the years of education that I've gained. Right? The most powerful teaching demonstrations I've seen are when they are, are framed as learning experiences. Right? So remember that first question? I asked you about what's your most powerful learning experience. We're going to come back to that in probably about six minutes. Right? And I'm going to have you think about it and frame it in that way. But thinking about your teaching demonstration as a learning demonstration, that switch in frame becomes really powerful. Yeah. What if, okay, so I had a friend, and he ended up getting a double campus um, uh, in a way, but um, he, he had a difficult thing, and I don't know how common this is, but um, they told him that his job class Yeah. In an actual yeah. Class. So how common is that? Yeah, you know, it's it's shockingly more common than you might expect. For one interview I went on, I had one of those, and it is it's hard because I'm in the middle of, of giving sort of here's why I'm brilliant and here's my here's what I think my future contributions to the field are going to be, yeah. but let me back out of this and talk about how I'm how I would use this and teach this to undergraduate students. That's exactly how I did it, right? I got through part of, part of my um, research demonstration. I said, but you know, I'm a, we're, this is a liberal arts college, right? Let's talk a little bit about how this plays into and feeds into how I teach and what I teach and how I engage with students. It's not the, the like, most glamorous transition, <laughs> right? But it worked. Um, and so I think those are more common, especially um, as people try, as departments get larger and um, you're trying to get people to meet, candidates to meet with more and more people, people have the impression that something has to give. And sometimes, well, we can just combine the teaching and research com presentations, make them a little bit longer instead of an, um, 50 minutes, you have 90 minutes and you have to do both, right? Um, and I think that can be a little bit awkward. But if that happens, think about Think about your research as providing the preface for the learning demonstration that you're going to provide, right? So your research becomes that introductory preface material, right? You bring them into an activity or a pair and share, or um, if you are strongest in a lecture and slide format, thinking about how can you engage with the students in your demonstration, right? At that point in time, and then bring it back through to your research as the foreshadowing for what comes next. It takes more planning, it takes a little, it takes more structure, but you can do it. Um, it's just knowing in advance that that's going to be what happens. But it's, it's awkward. Um, but it sometimes happens. Yeah. Ooh, um, so I probably can't speak for all Cal States, 
um, at Cal Poly, we see all sorts. I see people who come in and do, try to do slides with clickers, right? Um, and at Cal Poly, we don't have very many classes that, um, or classrooms that have over 100 seats, right? So the idea of a lecture with a clicker is, is probably not well matched um, to the Cal Poly teaching style. I've had people come in and do um, walking through sort of how would you set up a research design where it's a mixture of um, here's this research question, what, how do we figure out how to answer it? And it's more of an interactive um, guided discussion. Um, I've had people come in and do um, lectures with built-in interaction and have it go quite well. Um, I've had people come in and do um, an entire hour where it's not a lecture. Um, and it, it can go well, right? Um, so you see all sorts of things. Um, and I think that it goes back to the idea of reflecting on when do you think you show best as an educator? What types of learning experiences do you want to create in your classrooms? So when you actually land the job, because it turns out you land the job, right? So when you land the job, you, what kind of educator are you going to be, right? And you're trying to give your committee that image, right? Other things. Big picture advice and then any other questions? So my, we talked a little bit about um, reading the room and committing, right? I think you, have to, you do have to be able to read the room. You do have to be able to figure out, are people engaging with you or not? And if so, great. If not, what are you going to do, right? So you have to, to be able to do that and, and be a little bit flexible, be a little bit adaptable. Um, think about managing the room, right? Feel free to rearrange the furniture so that it best suits exactly what you want to do, right? Um, feel free to roam the room, right? Don't feel like you have to get stuck back by your slides if you have slides, right? Um, it's another way of showing that interaction, showing that level of engagement. Uh, all of that has to be done with sensitivity to the climate and what's happening in the room um, and with friendliness and humor, right? In addition to breathing, smiling and relaxing a little bit can go a long way. Um, the faculty hiring you have a lot riding on your presentation, too. They want to hire you. They want to hire the best person for the job, and they think you could be it. No one's going to take um, precious state resources <laughs> and fly out a candidate that they're not sure about. Right? They think that you can do this job. All you have to do is show them that you can, right? Which is part of that engaging with the room is making them feel like, hey, I can do this too, right? You all have those skills. You have all been in the classroom as a student or as a teacher or as both, right? You know when you learn best. You've thought about what kind of teacher or educator you want to be. All you have to do now is show the world, right? So lots of pressure, right? Because all you have to do is show the world. <laughs> That's why, so if you look at the very bottom of the triangle, there's the um, figure out how to show the best, most authentic version of you as an educator with an asterisk. It's right now, right? Right now where you're at. It is okay to be a novice. It's okay to not have all the answers. I think in, in job talks we tend to, or in, in um, interviews, we tend to think that as the interviewee we have to have all the answers. It's okay to, to um, if someone asks you that question that you don't know the answer to, because they, they're trying to, for whatever reason, see how you react. It's okay to turn the question back around. It's okay to say, huh. You know, that's a really great question that I hadn't really thought about in that way. Let's break down that question, right? You just have to believe that that's OK and accept that that's OK and figure out those tricks. You've all been in a classroom where you've asked or you've been asked a question you didn't know the answer to, right? Hopefully, right? It's OK to, be, to use those same <coughs> tools and tricks. How do you respond in that situation? 
what do you ask? Is it okay to turn the question around? You bet. It's a learning experience, not a teaching. It's a learning experience. It's a learning demonstration, not a teaching one. It's okay to realize that your teaching style will change. Other thoughts? Questions? Concerns? Okay, I want you to, I want us to back out of the reflection again. We're going to do those same three questions, so these are the bottom half. But we're going to start with what's the best advice that you've been given about a teaching demo? Reflect on your teaching style in the classroom, what types of educational experiences and contexts best reflect both who you are as an educator and your skill set. And the last one may be the most important. Combine those two things and think about what is your next step? What is the thing you want to work on most? What is the thing you need to practice or feel like you need more experience with? Sound good? Okay. Anyone willing to or want to share what their next step is? And it's also okay to say no. But if anybody wants to share, yeah. Um, I think I haven't had that much experience facilitating like smaller group discussions. Mm -hmm. I've done like more lecturing, like participating and things like that, like an engagement like with the whole classroom, but not so much like sitting down there with people and yeah. Okay, so are there ways that you could, opportunities for you to get that experience on campus? Um, I guess like being more creative with some of like the TA section of things, like in the way that discussion's done. Okay. Um, but yeah, they tend to be like kind of larger groups, so I don't think it's just... Do you have a Center for Teaching and Learning on campus? Yes, oh fabulous, you do, okay. So do, do, are there opportunities, do you set up, are there opportunities for people to practice those things? See, look at the synergy <laughs> happening. <laughs> I mean, that's, that makes it better for you to, like, have the uh -huh. what questions that are clear, right? Uh -huh. like, what okay. department? Oh, geography. Oh, so they um, oh. Oh, more on the human, like, they like humans. <laughs> <laughs> they like studying humans. Yeah. It's good. Very small level. <laughs> Very small. Other things? Other, anyone else want to share their next step? Or one thing they'd like to work on? Mm -hmm. so doesn't have any idea of what's going on. So one of the points I took from there, and I think I, I mean, it doesn't, it may or may not apply to teaching demos, but maybe classrooms of undergraduates, was um, 
knowing your material well enough and being able to digest it, to explain it to elementary school kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So part of that is that idea of being able to move between levels of explanation and having the flexibility to do that, right? Because um, surely you've all been in classroom experiences where you think you're being entirely clear, right? I am being precise and exact with my language. I, I know this material front and back and you have to figure out. So that's a good one, figuring out how to move up and down in levels. Oh yeah, it's a good one. Mm -hmm. It's like second grade. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. What's the matter with my ears? I don't know if it, it, it's this with the conversation. Oh, so one thing that I, I would want to work on and develop. So, and I, and I put this down as far as like my teaching style. I really love. I, I like to engage, and I love tangents. Like if mm -hmm. I ask a question and then people have other things and then we spend like three or four minutes. But I get this feedback in my evaluation even from. semester to get it evaluated, there's always a couple of students like, I wish you would just teach. Why are we talking about this? Why are we doing that? And it's interesting because it's usually the same race and gender. Who's uh -huh. it. And it's like, why are you bringing in your lived experience and encouraging other people to elevate their lived experience? I just want to know about X uh -huh. and get out of here. And so I feel like, because more than likely, in, in all transparency, I'll be applying to predominantly white institutions. Uh -huh. And I feel like that's something I'm going to have to navigate. So I want everyone to feel comfortable, but some but someone will be uncomfortable in that comfort. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to figure out a way to do both. Mm -hmm. I think it's valuable, um, and I want to be an institution that, that values that. Right. But I could see a seasoned, tenured faculty member going, "Here we go, black guy talking about black stuff." I'm like, oh, <laughs> I, can't, I can't hide that. How do I, how, right. How do I negotiate that? Because I because I, I absolutely believe in what in what you wrote here, and I, it made me happy. Like. Your authentic mm -hmm. self, but not everyone likes your authentic yeah, self. Yeah, it's so true. How do, you, how do I negotiate, or how do I spend this time now preparing to not appease to everyone, but to make someone who, do, who doesn't value that, because yeah. that's not something that has always been in, in these spaces, at least say, okay, like, I don't know. So uh, let me ask you this. Have you, in those experiences, when you um, sort of elevate lived experiences, which I think is important to do, um, in, in lots of areas. Do you explain it as a pedagogical tool? To my students? Yeah. Yes. Hmm. And they're not, I, so sometimes it might be just about reinforcing that connection. And I'm getting the, I'm getting the it's time to, to go yeah. option. But I'm, I, so I'm here for the next, I'm here for till one. So if you want to talk more, I'm happy to. Um, but I think one of the ways that I've seen that, seen people success, successfully navigate that is, is continuously reinforcing the role of that in your pedagogical environment. Like, what is it about this, right? So it's, it's the, taking the lived experience and then reminding them, reminding students continuously that here's why this is important. Like, here's how this connects to, right? And, and um, making that um, glaringly obvious and, and repeated. And then I think, that I, sometimes you may not reach everybody, right? But you can um, cut down on some of those things. Okay, last thing, my email address. If you have questions, right, please feel free to reach out. I'm, I'm incredibly responsive on email. My biggest pet peeve is when my email inbox has more than two emails in it. <laughs> email me and let me know, right? If you have questions, if you want to talk, if you want advice, um, if you want to talk about your specific circumstance um, and what, how I might be able to help with that, let me know. Otherwise, thank you for your flexibility and your time and your experiences and good luck. I wish you all the best. I have high hopes for you all. So thank you. Thank you.